to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter number 6 this evening. We're going to spend some time looking at uh, the flood tonight. We're not going to deal with all of it, but some things I want to point out to you that uh, you may not have noticed before. Once again, we're, we're studying our Bibles. We have started at the beginning. That's the best place to start. And we're doing a survey of Scripture. And we've taken our time here so far, particularly in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, because the first 11 chapters of Genesis are so fundamental. There is so much taught to us in the first 11 chapters of Genesis that really the world has a clue, doesn't have a clue about. And it is so fundamental for the rest of Scripture. There are so many topics that are dealt with that many times we overlook. We've seen the creation. We've seen the creation of man. We've seen the fall of man. We've seen with Cain and Abel uh, man-made religion. We saw it with, with Adam trying to make his own clothes. We saw it with with Cain, thinking he knew better than God, trying to bring his own sacrifice. We've seen so much, and it is fundamental to Scripture. Scripture builds upon each other that we understand and know the Word of God. So we're taking our time as we look through these first 11 chapters, uh, laying a foundation as we work our way through Scripture. Now looking at Genesis chapter 1, I'm going to read just a few verses this morning, or this evening. Look at verse number 1. We read some of these last week, but notice this. It says, And it came to pass... When men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that were fair, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Of course, we read about the wickedness of man. Let's get to verse number 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And, of course, we have, many of us know the story of the flood, and we'll read about it in a few minutes and more about it. But I want to keep these thoughts in mind this morning. We're going to go back or this evening and look back at a few things about this inner marriage and about the grace of God. So let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight and see what he would have for us. Let's pray. Father, we come to you tonight thanking you once again for the opportunity to be in your house. We thank you, Lord, for your blessings. We thank you, Lord, for your precious word. Lord, where would we be without the word of God? Lord, we thank you tonight for the opportunity to, to give to uh, this ministry that distributes the Word of God. Lord, I pray tonight as we open your Word that we would be attentive to the things you would have us to learn. Or may we not only be uh, learning the stories or relearning the stories, but understanding the importance of them, the application that we can make in our own lives. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and praise the holy name of Jesus. In the name of, in his name we ask it all. Amen. Now, last week, remember, we dealt a lot with the first part of chapter 6. Um, actually, we went back, and we remember last week we started with the genealogies. Woohoo! Yeah, that's exciting, isn't it? But, in looking at the genealogies, hopefully we begin to understand there was a purpose in them. And we saw last week, at least part of the purpose in the genealogies given to us in chapters 4 and 5. When we saw the genealogies... Uh, of the line of Seth and the line of Cain. And we read through them and we how, saw how God put little tidbits in there about Enoch and about Lamech. And then, understanding the flow of Scripture, when we come to chapter 6, we see that on the tail end of the genealogies, we have where the sons of God and the daughters of men are married. And we talked last week about some other ideas about what that may mean. But as we explained last week, I think it's plain through the flow of Scripture that we're dealing with an intermarriage of the two lines. There had been a separation between the line of Seth and the line of Cain. We come to chapter 6, it starts out that they begin to multiply. And why, why is that? Well, because the sons of God, the godly line of Seth, and the daughters of men, the ungodly line of Cain, began to intermarry. Well, what we didn't mention, I want to do tonight, is go back and look at a few other scriptures concerning this. And we dealt with that last week, showed you some other scriptures why um, we believe that that is the case. It's the line of Seth and the line of Cain. But uh, understand this. God never looks favorably upon a marriage of a child of his and a child of the world. Okay? Well, I believe we see it first and foremost here. Now, turn with me to Exodus. We're going to look at a few verses of Scripture, and I've 
I want to look at these because I want everyone to understand it. I want them to see it. Sometimes I, we take for granted that everyone knows these things. Well, I don't want you to assume you know it. I don't want you to assume I'm just saying it. I want to show you from Scripture. Okay? In Exodus chapter 34, God here speaking to the children of Israel. Beginning reading verse number 12. He says, Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whither thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. So understand, he's warning them about they're getting ready to go into the land, some things they are not to do. They're not to make a covenant with them. Continue reading verse 13. But ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. For thou shalt worship no other god. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a whoring after their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods, and one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice. And thou take of their daughters unto thy sons, and their daughters go whoring after their gods, and make thy sons go whoring after their gods. Thou shalt make thee no molten gods. Notice here, in the midst of this command, this warning, what is in the middle of it? That they shouldn't intermarry with the Canaanites. God never looks favorably upon his child marrying a child of the world. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 7. We'll see it again. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Again, reading in verse number 1, it says, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and have cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, and the Gergesites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, seven nations gather stronger and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shalt thou... Make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me, and they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. Does God look lightly upon it? No. Now remember, we're reading this for the second time, but Moses is speaking here to the second generation. The second generation of Israelites. Remember at this point, the first generation has wandered in the wilderness and has died. Now the second generation is getting ready to go in and it's important. But how many times do we hear or try to rationalize, but it's okay. If I marry him, I'll win him. What does God say here? He says the exact opposite. No, if you marry them, they're going to turn your heart away from me. Turn to Nehemiah. Now, I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but I figure if God keeps mentioning, I might as well too. <laughs> Nehemiah, chapter 13. Nehemiah 13, begin reading in verse number 23. Nehemiah 13, verse 23. In those days also saw I Jews that had married wives of Ashdod and Amnon and of Moab. Hmm. Were they told not to do that? Oh, okay, just want to make sure you're paying attention. And their children spake half in the speech of Ashdod and could not speak in the Jews' language, but according to the language of each people. And I contended with them and, and cursed them and smote certain of them and plucked off their hair and made them swear by God, saying, Ye shall not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there no king like him, who was beloved of God, and God hath made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. Shall we then hearken unto you to do all this great evil, to transgress against our God in marrying strange Wives. Is God making a point for us? Okay. 
Let's turn to 2 Corinthians, a New Testament passage with which we are probably very familiar. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Here in Second Corinthians, we have simply the principle of separation. Many times we apply it to marriage, and we do it rightly so, but it's not the only application of it. But being separated. Understand here, as we look at Scripture, God does not look favorably upon a marriage of a saved individual and an unsaved individual. I think one just over and over again, that yes, you may think you're going to win them, but I'm telling you, I know the opposite's going to happen. Instead of you pulling them up, they're going to pull you down. Okay? Now, once again, I don't want to assume you know it. And I have a twofold purpose. I know, you know, there's not many folks in here who aren't married, but most of us in here have children. And we need to train our children these principles of God's word, God's word. When they begin looking for that husband, that wife, they need to look for a Christian husband, Christian wife, a godly man, a godly woman. That is the marriage that God will bless. And we need to train them in that direction. We can't assume that they're going to do what's right. In fact, we need to assume the exact opposite because we're all sinners and we tend to uh, fall in that direction, don't we? So as we see here, a principle laid out for us beginning in the book of Genesis, God does not look favorably upon an unequally yoked marriage. Let us be careful to not only understand it, but to teach it to the generation that falls behind us. Now as we continue looking here, we're going to come to um, verse 6 and verse 7. We see, of course, that the Lord is going to bring judgment upon the earth because, as he said in verse 5, it says, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So we see that the world is going to be judged because of the great wickedness that is in the earth. There's a climax of, of wickedness and depravity here, and because of that, we're going to see that you know God is going to send a flood upon the earth. He's going to judge the world for its wickedness. But we see in verse number 8, but Noah found grace. He found grace in the eyes of the Lord. What is grace? Someone tell me, what is grace? Unmerited favor. What did Noah do to earn God's grace? Nothing. You can't, earn, you can't earn grace, right? By definition, you can't earn it. But we see here, he finds grace. And in verse 9, it tells us, Noah was a just man and perfect in his generation. And Noah walked with God. He walked with God. Now, Let's see here. Let me find the verse. Mm -hmm. Can't get my eyes on it. My buff, my, my bifocals aren't working. What was that smart remark? Okay. Look at chapter 5, verse 22. There it is. Chapter 5, verse 22. And what did Noah do? He found grace. And according to verse number 9, he was just, and he did what? 
He walked with God. Look at chapter 5, verse 22. Do you see something that rings a bell? Enoch did what? Who walked with God. He walked with God. So we have two men, two men in Scripture that's recorded that they did what? Walked with God. Now that isn't a coincidence. Okay, God pointed it out for us. Enoch walked with God and what happened? Hey, hey, he didn't die, remember? He was taken home. Noah walked with God. And as a result of walking with God, what happens to Noah? He finds grace and what happens to him? He's spared in the flood, right? Okay. Two men who God says they walked with God. And then in conjunction with walking with God, we find two extraordinary circumstances. Because Enoch walked with God, he did not see death. He was taken to glory. Because Noah walked with God, God uses him to build an ark, and he is spared in that ark. You see a connection here? Okay, good, because I'm going to make some more connections in a minute for you. Okay, so two men in Scripture so far have been noted that they walked with God. Now, verse number 10, verse, Noah walks with God. He has three children, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. It says, And the earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh, had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth shall be 50 cubits, and the height shall be 30 cubits. A window shalt thou make to the ark. You say, why? If you were in the ark, you'd know why. You'd be appreciating that window, wouldn't you? Okay? There'd be a window in the ark. And in a cubit shalt thou finish it above. And the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof. With lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven. And everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant. And thou shalt come unto the ark, thou, and thy sons, and thy wife, and thy sons' wives with thee. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark, to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female, of fowls after their kind, and of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind. Two of every sort shalt thou or shalt come unto thee to keep them alive. And take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it uh, to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. So we have God's commandment here for Noah to build the ark. Noah is selected. He finds grace in the eyes of the Lord. Notice because of that, uh, as we made note of in verse 9 and 10, Noah is a just man. He is perfect, meaning he's complete, he's mature, and he walked with God. Something that's only said so far of one other man, that being Enoch. Now we see the conditions in which he builds this ark. We see the wickedness of man, and we see the directions that are given. The directions are very clear. An ark made of gopher wood, um, the size of the ark, uh, using feet, because we're more familiar with feet than cubics, assuming a cubic is approximately 18 inches. You're looking at an ark, a boat being 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Okay? More than likely, it was just a square boat. You know what the intent of the ark was? To float. That's all it was made to do. To float. It wasn't supposed to be, you know, some speed demon in the water. It was just made to float. Because in it floating, God's going to spare Noah and his family 
and, the, of course, the animal kingdom. Notice God did not say anything about making a rudder, did he? A steering column of any kind. He didn't mention about building a motor. He said, make an ark. Make it of wood. Make it this long, this wide, this tall. Make sure it's got a window in it because you're going to want one once we get started. And make a ramp. Make it three stories. Have three stories in it. Put the animals in. Now, some people have a problem with Noah and the ark. But how did Noah get all those animals on the ark? It's really not that complicated. You know how many dogs you need? Two. You get, now, people get really upset. But there's so many different kinds of dogs. Yeah, there are. But you understand the gene pool is a lot, you know, a lot purer back then. And you can get all the dogs we have today from two dogs out of Noah's Ark. Even the Chihuahuas. The Chihuahuas. The itty, itty bitty ones. The real big ones. They all come from two dogs. You realize you didn't have to take a wolf either. The wolf and the dog are related. So I, I needed just two. And now we already talked about th there, there were dinosaurs. Remember that? You know there are dinosaurs on the ark? No, you can't get dinosaurs on the ark. Yeah, you can. You take baby ones. In fact, I, I'm pretty sure when God brought all the animals, he probably bought babies. Stop and think about it. Babies eat a lot less. And when you're Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and you got cleanup duty, you're glad they're babies. <laughs> Imagine two elephants on the ark. Would you want two babies or two grown-ups? If you got cleanup duty, you want babies. <laughs> now, I know it's kind of funny, but we're being very practical here, right? Many times we think about, and we see in the Sunday school, the actual pictures of the big animals coming. I don't think God brought the adults. I, thought he, I think he brought the babies. He just made sure he had a pink one and a blue one, and we're all good. <laughs> right? Now, not only do we think about it practically in the fact that they would eat less, they would mess up less, but babies are also much more resilient. Now, I don't get the impression from the account of the flood that the flood was a you know, flat, calm sea. I get the idea it was very rough. Uh, if an adult falls down and a child falls down, which one's getting up quicker? The child. What's the adult going to do? Lay down and think about it a minute. Right? A kid, how many times do you see, even around here, kids are running, I'm going to go to full steam and then wipe out. And you're thinking, oh my goodness, they've broken an arm. No, they jump right up and keep right on going. If it happens to one of us that are grown up, we broke an arm or thought, thought we broke an arm or we twisted something, and we're, we're real slow to get up. Does it not make sense that when God brought the animals to Noah that he probably bought, brought the babies? Now, it doesn't say that, but this used to be practical. Now, he didn't have to bring every what we call species of animal. That's, that's a man-made term. He just brought every, one of every kind. Out of that kind could come all the different variations. So he selects Noah. He's given him directions how to build the ark. And notice in verse number 14. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. He is to pitch it with pitch. Pitch uh, is from the Hebrew word kaphar, K-A-P-H-A-R, with the transliteration. It's the same word that's later translated atonement. It is atoned within and without. And we understand, as we're going to see, you probably know, many of you being in church a long time, that the ark is a picture of salvation. It's also a picture of something else. We'll get to that in a minute. That pitch that goes, you know, 
between the boards. Keeps the water out, right? All right. When we're in Christ, we are pitched within and without. We, atonement has been made for us. We have here that picture of the pitch being used in the ark. Now, let me give you something else real quick. I need some volunteers. I need Enoch. Who wants to be my Enoch? Keith? Okay, Keith is Enoch. So come on up, Keith. Who's Enoch? I mean, who's Moses? I'm oh, not Moses. We're not in Moses yet. Who's Noah? I got Enoch. I need, no- I need Noah. Oh, Terry is Noah. Okay. All right. So here we have Enoch. Okay. Enoch's over here. And we got Noah coming over here. Not Methuselah. <laughs> Noah. All right. Now, what do these two men have in common according to Scripture? They both walked with God. Right? Okay. Now, what is this man going to do? He's going to build an ark. Okay? Now, we know from our study last week that this man has a grandson, right? I believe Methuselah. And Methuselah's name meant what? If you don't remember exactly, just give me the, the, the gist. When he dies... Okay, basically, when, when he dies, judgment is coming. Okay? Now, Enoch, he already knows what's going to take place. He might not know the details, but he knows when, his, when Methuselah dies, judgment is coming. In fact, the New Testament tells us Enoch even wrote a book. Okay? Talking about the judgment of the Lord coming. You're a smart dude, you know that? But not only that, he walked with God. He knows judgment is coming, right? Now, not only does he know judgment is coming, but so does Noah. And God tells him, you're going to build an ark. That's how I'm going to spare you. Now, both of these men walk with God. Judgment is coming. What happened to this man? Okay, raise your hands. Because you're going to point up because God's going to take you home, right? Now, no, he, he escapes the flood. Understand that? He escapes it. God takes him home. He doesn't die. God takes him home. What happens to this man? Okay. He is also spared, but how? He goes through the flood. So point that way because you're going to go through it. Okay. So both of them, both of them are going to be spared, are they not? He is spared. This is like the YMCA, isn't it? This man is going to be spared. God's going to spare him totally from judgment. Because God's going to judge the whole world, right? He is taken out before the judgment even comes. He doesn't see it at all. This man, on the other hand, he sees the judgment. But he is spared through it. You understand that? Now, if we study the New Testament, there is a parallel to this. Many times if we study the New Testament... Foundations are given for us in the Old Testament. God was getting ready to judge the world right here, right? Both of them knew judgment was coming. One was spared because he was taken home. He never saw it. This one is taken through the judgment and spared. Is there not coming a day where God's going to judge the world again? What do we call that time period? The tribulation. There's a group of people that are going to be taken home. They're not going to see the judgment. Who's that? That's to say, that's a church. But there's another group of people who are going to go through the tribulation and be spared. Who is that? The Jews, Israel. Do we see a picture of God's painting for us here? Thank you. I know your arms are getting tired. Thank you, gentlemen. It's amazing if we understand the Old Testament, we begin to see how the New Testament comes to light. There are bearings in the Old Testament that help us understand the New Testament. You'll also find, as you study the book of Revelation, there are parallels many times between the judgments of Revelation and the judgments that take place in Exodus. Start thinking about some of the things that take place during the tribulation period. If you've got your thinking cap on, you got to, didn't Moses do something like that? Yeah, remember what, one of the things was, for instance, the water turning to blood? You realize that's going to happen in the future. 
Remember the darkness that took place in Egypt? It's going to take place in the future as well. There's a lot of parallels. God is teaching us in the Old Testament what has happened so we can better understand what's happening now and, of course, what is future. So we see a parallel. Two men walk with God. Both of them escape judgment. One is saved from it. That's the church represented by Enoch. He's taken home, doesn't see death. There's another group of people, like Noah, who go through it, but are spared through it. That is Israel. Chapter 7 and chapter 8 actually bring us to the flood itself. And that's a good place to stop. And we'll pick up there next week. So we're going to leave Noah building the ark. One week is going to make that much difference when he did it for 120 years. So we're going to leave him building the ark for one more week, okay? Next week we'll give him a break. We'll let him finish up that ark and escape the, the coming judgment. Aren't you glad that we're going to escape judgment? I am. Let's pray tonight. Father, we come to you tonight thanking you for your blessings. We thank you from your word, the lessons that we can learn. Lord, help us not just to simply learn Bible stories. Lord, to understand better not only the story, but the application that we can make in our own lives. Lord, we see in the world around us where much of the wickedness that's taking place is that very comparative to that, to that of Noah's day. Lord, you tell us that in the closing days, Lord, it's going to be like it was in the days of Noah. Lord, may it be said of us that we walk with God. Lord, help us to be the exception, not the rule in society. Lord, it would be a tremendous testimony for each and every one of us like Noah, that it could be said he was a just man, that he walked with God. Lord, we thank you for the wonderful grace that you extend to each and every one of us. Lord, help us tonight as we get ready to close our service to understand what we have discussed tonight from your word, what's clearly been presented to us. Lord, may we make the applications tonight and be doers of the word, not simply hearers. We love and thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name we ask it all. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I ask Miss James to begin to play. I ask you to stand to your feet. I don't know what the Lord may be dealing with you about tonight, but we're going to have an invitation. If God is dealing with you about something, or tonight maybe there's a burden on your heart, Maybe tonight you've been challenged by the testimony of Enoch, the testimony of Noah, and you want to be a man that, it can be said, walked with God. Wherever the situation is, I'm asking you just to, in the quietness of the invitation, do business with God. If you need to come to an altar and talk to Him, you can do so. But as she plays tonight, as she plays, you do business with Him.